Hello, everybody. It's good to see you. I guess you can talk. You're not allowed to sing, you know. Um, this, this thing is going to end. This thing is going to end. This, there's, you know, there, there've been human, there's been humans, let's be evolutionary. There's been humans on the earth for millions of years without mass. You're going to be fine. <laughs> I just became a scientist. Hallelujah. I'm a little snarky this morning. Mama's all filled with the Holy Ghost and I'm all filled with uh, my pot stir and stuff. But, but it's gonna be all right. Man, it's good to see you. And uh, yeah, go ahead. In fact, get, give a clap offering to the Lord. Come on. Hallelujah, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. You are the great king over all the earth and your name will last forever. forever. Last night I was looking at my passage over here about David and I just got, I just got moved by, well, I don't know if you, these things are on the wall, you, you, you overlook them after a while. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, this is, this is 3,000 years ago. I will raise up for your offspring after you who shall, one who shall come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. All the ages. Hallelujah. And that's, the, that's where we are in our study. Um, as far as our offering, we'll show you that we'll give you the text to give. Um, we, we have discovered that people give out of principle, conviction, and uh, they, don't, they don't give out of compulsion. I've known this for a long, long time, but it's been magnified during this this season of losses of income, losses of jobs, losses of freedoms. And yet people have continued out of the conviction of their heart to sow generously into the kingdom of God and have seen their giving uh, to, the, to, the, the, to their church, to the ministry of the gospel at the church as a giving unto Jesus. And you've not held back. God bless you. There are boxes, there's a box as you go out of this door and there's a box as you go out of the other door and you can exercise um, your, your free will offerings in those ways. All right, may the Lord bless you in that. If you have a Bible and you like to turn in the Bible, you'll go to Ephesians chapter three. And if not, as always, I've spoiled you with the text. And it's always there for you. But some of you will like other translations. And when I come to this passage, it's, a, it's especially a passage where people um, like other translations. Um, before I go into the text, it's just, I keep thinking about, uh, I, I first learned this from business people um, about the Pike syndrome. And I just wanna put it in front of you. Um, there was an experiment conducted 100, 147 years ago, I think it was, by a German zoologist, Carl Mobius. He filled a glass tank with water and he put a pike in there. Pike are aggressive carnivores. And then, of course, he put feeder fish in there and the pike just devoured them. And for a while, he did that. And then after a while, he took a glass and divided the aquarium, if you will. And, uh, and then he started to put feeder fish on the other side of the glass. 
and the pike would attack. And you know what would happen to no avail. The pike would attack and attack and attack and would, would hit the glass so hard, would stun himself and wobble. I saw one report said he'd even turn over like he was, <laughs> while he was recovering like a dead fish. After a while, he stopped striking. Mobius removed the glass, removed the barrier. And after that time, the feeder fish could literally swim around the mouth of the pike. And he would never strike them. I'm not going there. But I know 100% that some people, and maybe some of you, for a very long time, will have your habits changed by intimidation. And um, I'm going to be very kind about it. Well, as kind as I can be. People have never accused me of extreme kindness. I'm actually much kinder than people think. I'm just confrontational. Because I want you to confront me and I want to confront you. We're not made to live in that. But we're being, we're being trained. We're being trained. And we're doing this. And I want you to understand, New Life City is doing this because of our belief in the love of brother. Not because, not because we assent to and, and embrace every measure that's been asked of us. And I want you to know something. It's been asked of us because we are free. And uh, on this Memorial Day weekend, as we remember those who uh, laid down their life for freedom, th- there may be freer nations on earth. I don't know it. And there's been nothing so amazing about this country as freedom. And I find myself as as a pastor suddenly on the horns of a dilemma in that that we're free, folks. We are free. But we have voluntarily laid aside our freedom for the love of our brother and sister. So let's make it plain. This thing hadn't been taken from us. We've laid it down. And, and so I've spoken in two ways to the, to the people, the, not just the body of Christ, but to the people. I've said, I've, I've made a public voice. You can do this. You can go a little further. You don't have to lose heart. You can, we can do this for the good of the community. And at the same time, say to those in authority, <laughs> Don't get the idea that you can do this forever to us. Do you understand that? Now, I've done it by making an appeal so far. So far. Um, Anyway, I'll promise you I will announce when when I'm coming to church without a mask. (laughs) Hallelujah. Be quiet, Alan, before you before you get yourself in trouble. But, but listen, we've done this for, for, for the love of, of brother and sister, but this is not how we're made to live. And it's not even how your body is designed to work. Let me be evolutionary again. You, you got it? <laughs> These human bodies have endured a great deal. And um, by the design of God and by the grace of God, we will overcome this virus. All right, I'm a little, let me get to the word of God because I always act better when I'm in the word of God. I'm always a a better fellow. Um, And I I will tell you this, this is true. This is, I know this is true because it's so true of me. I know this is true of all of us. The voice that we listen to 
determines the life that we become. So I can, oh man, you are, I, I, hallelujah. Mom's put me on a leash today, so I gotta, I, I gotta get going here. So <laughs> let me also do what I've been doing. Uh, as, I, as I've done these texts, I have really enjoyed the fact that, that I'm giving you the text one week, and then if you can see, I'm layering the text week by week. Um, l- Hallelujah, let me just go. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, all the times I've studied this passage, all the times I've studied the Bible. It's never, I've never leaned into what this meant, but you know that I've been leaning into this. Paul says he's a prisoner on behalf of them. All right, in other words, there's cause and effect in this world. And even on this thing we're doing right now, cause and effect, the last thing we would want is for us to just say, we're defying everything, we're not doing anything, uh, come on down here. And then, it, it, listen, it would, more, it would mortify me if an infection spread among the people because I, was, because I was defiant and because I wasn't careful and because I didn't concern myself with my neighbor. And then I remember when, when Randy was here, y'all remember that? <laughs> it was right on the cusp of that, literally on the heel of that. We shut down on the Sunday. We've been basically shut down since then. And I, and I got sick immediately after that. And I was like, wow, if, what, if, yeah, what if? I was dealing with the what if. What if that, that we allowed this thing to spread through a group of people? Now, uh, I don't want to do it now because, men, uh, not only do you not want people to get harmed, you don't want the name of the Lord to be besmirched because they are able to, glum onto you and say you're the cause of it. But there are always causal things. And along the line in your life, somewhere along the line, you're going to do something for which someone else will suffer. And Paul is not even messing around here. I'm a prisoner of Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. Follow it. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Oh, how I love that text. Because the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And what is the church? Ah, the mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, through the announcement of good news. And and it eludes us that Paul was in prison for preaching that. We think he went and preached the gospel. Whenever we hear somebody say we went and preached the gospel, we think about Billy Graham. If you're my generation, if you're not my generation, you go, who's that? (laughs) But you think about Billy Graham and how Billy Graham traveled the world And a simple gospel, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. I love Billy, but that's not why Paul was being, was thrown in prison. Paul was thrown in prison because he preached a gospel that disrupted the social order. And when you disrupt the social order, you get called into account by the authorities. The authorities over the world that Paul was living in were the Roman leaders. Paul was a disturber of the peace because Paul came in and he was, listen, he was not a revivalist. Love my revivalist. 
I was glib last night. I'll be more careful this morning. Um, Bill Johnson and Randy Clark and Heidi Baker, they're revivalists. By the way, they have bigger things in their heart than revival, but they're revivalists. And, and, and they're, they're paying a price for it. If you're going to go, if you're going to, go to social transformation, if you, it's going to have to go generational. And if it goes generational, it has to move from an outpouring of the Holy Spirit to a transformation of the culture. And transformations of culture never happen without a terrible price. And of course, the bakers know that very well in, the, in Mozambique. And um, I, I heard Bill talking about this thing that God has called him to. I heard Bill give a message, a most personal message I've ever heard him give about his own encounter with the Holy Spirit and how unlike most people who went to Toronto, he went there and rather than being, um, as we say, whacked or wrecked by the Holy Ghost, he said, all that happened to me was I received a seed. And then he actually tells the process of nurturing that seed inside of him. And now he's talking about the process of transgenerational um, change. That is reformation. Now, Paul... He, listen, he was not there on the day of Pentecost. He's a latecomer to the party. The revival, the outpouring of the Spirit happened without him. By the way, next weekend is Pentecost. Let's get a little happy around here. I, I don't know. We got to find ways to make noise that don't involve singing if we, or something. We got we to, gotta, you know, bro, am I, hallelujah, cowbells. Cowbells. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm really tempted to do it anyway. Hallelujah. First time you think of something, you shouldn't do it. To help me. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm all right. In the Bible, uh, the, in the New Testament, Pentecost is only mentioned three times. The day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and then the post-Pentecost celebrations, it's mentioned two other times, both times in relation to Paul's relationship to the Ephesians. You can look that up. It's just a little strange thing. Maybe I'll highlight it next week. I won't do too much with it right now. But this is the mystery, the mystery that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Best thing I can do to make you feel it, but you won't really feel it. This means that the, this, this is culturally, it's similar uh, to what happens uh, in the old Jim Crow South when you, when you break the separate but equal standards that were there. I did it a couple times. I got thrown out of a restaurant and a, and a pool hall. I got thrown out of a pool hall because I, I took my black friend, Troy, after I got born again, I, I I'd always went down to the um, to Ferris Street in Jackson, Mississippi and shot pool um, with, with my coworkers. I was uh, the only white on an all black work crew. And I, they loved to have the, they loved to have white bread come in there and shoot pool with them. Oh, they loved it, man. They would put, maybe make bets on me or against me, mostly against me. <laughs> and, and then I, I took my friend to the pool hall where I shot pool, and we got summarily removed. The second time was even more surprising because in those days, if you, if you, there was a restaurant across the street from where we all worked together on the docks. If you went to the restaurant... I would go in the front door and eat in the dining room and the guys I worked with went in the back on a, on, yes, this really happened, on, on sawhorse with, with a table on sawhorses and sit around a table in the midst of the storage room and they would be served back there. And so after I got born again, I said, I said I'm gonna go eat with you guys. 
I thought, this is not any big deal. It's just me saying, I love you and we gotta, we gotta do this. I got thrown out of the storage room. Now, I want you to say that because I want you to feel it because this is really what happened. Paul was eating and having complete fellowship and inviting Gentiles into everything that had to do with his Jewish Christian faith. And God was affirming it by pouring the Holy Spirit on, on these Gentiles. And it created a riot in Ephesus. And then it created a near riot in the temple in Jerusalem. And every time something like this happened, Paul was in trouble. And ultimately in prison. Uh, you're, you're, some of you are thinking, are, are you saying that Paul was, a, was an equal rights advocate? No, I'm saying he was a gospel preacher. A gospel preacher. And the gospel is this. You want the good news? Here's the good news. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, opened the windows of heaven and poured out his spirit upon all flesh so that whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, be, the, be they of any kindred, any tribe, any tongue, any nation. And without any barrier, God poured his spirit out on them so that they could be made into one family. And that was really good news. He says, he says, it's a mystery. The Gentiles are fellow heirs. And Paul's great project that he went about through all the, new, the, the world doing was to invite Jews and Gentiles to eat at one table. And people... Anytime you feel the spirit of intimidation in your home, you need to go. You need to go at it. I'm telling you, I feel the spirit of intimidation everywhere I go nowadays, whether it's politics, religion, whether it's social things, relational things. I feel the spirit of intimidation and I always go, okay, what is that? And is that something that God's asking me to submit to or is that something God wants me to push over? Paul said, by revelation, I learned that what God had done was, as the book of Acts says, pour out his spirit on all flesh. Hallelujah. Paul says, I'm a prisoner for that. I've been beaten for that. It's very strange because this is not how we've thought about it over the years. But there it is. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power to me. Though I am the very least of all the saints, grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And you should read that and say, what? Because he's telling you the plan of God. So listen to me. I, I want you to get this. The church right now, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the earth is vilified and scandalized and often not without a cause. Everywhere you go. I, uh, I, I was like, Lord, you gave me this assignment so long ago. Oh my goodness. He gave me this assignment now it's been, I think, 47 years ago where God clarified to me what my assignment was. 
And, and we will come to the passage in the book of Ephesians where he transformed my life forever and said to me, because listen, I wanted to be a missionary. And he said, I'm gonna nail you to the door of the local church. Man, I've been chafing at it ever since. Hallelujah. By the way, allow me a moment to celebrate on tomorrow. It's not only Memorial Day, it is our wedding anniversary. And I asked this lady to go with me on this journey. And she has said yes and yes and yes and yes. And we find ourselves still at this point of life saying yes. When I come in here and I'm with you, and the power of the Holy Spirit comes. And I'm like, yeah, Lord, it's a yes, it's a yes, it's a yes. And then I go out and live normal life. And I say, what was I thinking But Holy Spirit comes, Spirit of Revelation comes. You are desperate for the Spirit of Revelation to be in your life. And I am so blessed this time, at this point in my life, going through this book where Paul is talking about things that have always been there and I'm seeing them. The Spirit of Revelation coming upon him. And such a revelation came upon him that God could ask him to do a thing that would cost him the skin on his back and the strength in his body and would confine him to years of imprisonment and ultimately be his death. But the call of God upon him was of such a greatness and such a force that he was like, it'll be worth it. And when I heard uh, Bill Johnson talking about going to, to uh, Toronto and Instead of being disappointed that the thing that was happening to everyone didn't happen to him, he said, I came home with a knowing that I had a seed. He said, I wanted a tree, but I got a seed. And he let that thing go inside of him and he meditated on that thing. And he said, it became so obsessive to me that in my sleep, it was upon me. And it wasn't until months later Months later, that the power of God came upon him at three o'clock in the morning. And he said, I was beset with a series of visions in which God would say to me, God was saying to me, you said, whatever it costs, here's what it will cost. You said, whatever it costs, here's what it'll cost. You said, I don't care what you do to me. Here's what it'll cost. And he said, I saw a series of visions and, he, and that would Will you, are you willing to be a byword and a scorn? Are you willing to be a scandal and a shame? Are you willing to be disgraced and hated? Are you willing to be spoken of evil for things that you can't defend yourself? One thing after another. But the, but the seed was alive. Okay, see, I'm telling you, this man here, this man, had the spirit of revelation come upon him and he would literally go into the synagogue and proclaim that Jesus was not merely the Lord of the Jews, but he was the Lord of the whole earth. Jesus, when he would proclaim Jesus, he was literally making Jesus equal with God. He was making a man the seed of David. He was saying, this is the man that was been waiting for. This is the man that the prophets, this is the man who came according to the scriptures and died. And he preached this gospel. And in the midst of it, the, the, the Jews had been working on a project for a very long time that Gentiles would be converted, that they would bring, be the light of God to the world. And Gentiles were in those days in the synagogues, but listen, just like in the temple, the Gentiles were partitioned in a place in the back of the room. And Paul had the temerity and the audacity to say, this God has made no distinction between Jew and Gentile. <laughs> he wrecked the way they were doing church. We are in the middle of a great crisis. 
And some of you are mad because you've heard people that you think have bad intentions talk about never waste a good crisis. And if you look around the globe, you see bad actors in the world who are doing terrible things not to waste this crisis. I could name them and you would all get stirred up. But let me say to you, you should be crying out to God and saying, don't waste this crisis. Let, don't let this crisis be wasted on us. Let this crisis be for your glory in such a way that we go through this pain so that it will be for transformation so that the church can be of such a nature that the Gentiles will understand the unsearchable riches of Christ and that we will become, we will become of such a kind that we will demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and powers. This is the gospel. And so, pastor, what if at this age you lose your church? Pastor, what if at this age you lose the ability to preach the gospel? That thing that you live for and breathe for. Who will say, no matter what it costs me, if it can be to the glory of God, how could this man spend the time he spent in the places of Listen, prison, you, it's, oh my goodness. You talk about no picnic. If you didn't have friends, if you were in prison, you were a lost soul. Prison was not the place you went to for punishment. It was the place you went to to wait for sentencing, which was either life or death. At the time of, of, of Saul, Paul the apostle. And so I'm like, I've been preaching this thing for all these years and I'm gonna come to this place in life, this place, and you're gonna show me things that I haven't seen? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, you bet. Come, come up here. Come up here. This is the call of God, not just to John the apostle, but to all of us. Remember, even Paul speaks of the time when he was called, come up here. This is the call of God on the church. Come up here. I want you to come up here. And listen, you in in your vocations where you are, you know that the spirit of revelation is of such a kind and such a nature that if you give yourself to any kind of a craft on this earth, you are a divine image bearer. And as a divine image bearer, when you devote yourself, when you give yourself, there comes a time in which You are lifted up literally out of yourself and these things become like such of such a second nature to you that that you move from learning the steps to creating the dance. This spirit comes upon you. I'm telling you, it's good that the Bible told, the first time the Bible tells us about the Holy Spirit coming, it was upon craftsmen. I'm telling you, This thing works in humanity so that it comes upon us, whether we're in the scientific lab or if we're sitting at the piano or even if we're working in the yard and the yard is our craft. No matter what you're doing, you're designed for this spirit of revelation to take you to a place where something that was impossible becomes easy. And God wants to take us corporately as the body of Christ to a place where, listen, can you even believe it? Can you even imagine it? That the church would, be, would present that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made known. Yes. Yes. This is why I live for. And this is what I invite us into. So what will become of us? We don't know. We don't know. But if it is despoiled by the spirit of bitterness and anger, we will not show the manifold wisdom of God. Hallelujah. This was a, okay, that was introduction. I've gotten to where I do that. But it's all right, that was also most of it. Just this one more point. I was studying this week and 
I always listen to other preachers preach. So I can feel your pain. And I turned on one preacher and he went through these first 10 verses of chapter three. And actually we were where he went to the, was starting with verse 11. And, and he said, he said, looking back on that, he said, he said, well, this is the place where we get back on the subject because Paul went on a rabbit trail in the passages we just read. I went, what? What? Wait, wait, you think this man was like a, 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 a preacher who preaches every week, who stands up in front of people and after having read too many things that week and after having had too many dreams that week, he gets up and, and, and bloviates the thing that dances across his head like I do as a preacher sometimes. I went, you, you, you're telling me that this man sat down and put pen to paper and uh, not like that. <laughs> when he put down his thoughts that he went on a rabbit trail, I told them last night, if I could have climbed into that recording and grabbed that preacher by the throat. I was like, oh my goodness, you mean to tell me, oh, how colossally missing the point. No, no, all of this is the point. Because look what he says. This was according to the eternal purpose that has been, that has, that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. What was this? this what do you mean well I mean Paul I'm going to take you and I'm going to do something with you and there's a purpose in it and I'm going to wring out of you I'm going to crush these grapes and turn them into wine I'm going to make a dye that I can paint the world with I'm going to use you, Paul, the apostle. I'm going to do this. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus. What, what was? That the church would become the manifold wisdom of God made known to the powers. It was the purpose that he realized in Jesus Christ. It was his purpose that he realized in his son. If you understand your Old Testament, you would say, why were the Jews the only people of God? And I could take you on a long journey and tell you why I think that was. But that was not God's ultimate purpose for which he is very patient about working out. His ultimate purpose was that through the Gentiles or through the Jews, God would make himself known to all the nations and that his lordship of all the nations would be manifest in the earth. And, and this crazy man who's in prison has the audacity to believe that God has changed history through what he has done. And he hears part of it. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you, do not lose heart over what I'm suffering for you which is your glory. Hallelujah. Get it now. <laughs> in the book of Hebrews, we ask them not to lose heart over what is happening to them. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says, don't lose heart over what's happening to me. It's for you. And now the question becomes, are you willing for your life to become something, oh my goodness. So that you can say, for you. We so segment our lives as Western Christians and, and as Americans, this is over here and this is over here and this is over here and this is mine and somewhere along the line, God's going to have a people who say there's no mine. There's no mine. Now, every once in a while, you get on a project and you're working on a project and you don't have 
the access you need to accomplish the project. And suddenly, someone comes along with the favor and says, I've got the access, come with me. And what Paul is saying here is that Jesus is the one who now gives us access. Jesus is our all access pass to the Father in order that we can have boldness and confidence. Because you see, this part of the Ephesians, and frankly, most of the first three chapters is really written as a prayer. It's like how how we all learn... I remember I used to think prayers had a certain form that you had to follow. And then I got filled with the Spirit and realized I could be praying. And the next thing you know, I'm talking to you. And the next thing you know, I'm praying and I'm talking to you. And people are like, well, do I open my eyes, close my eyes, do I stand up, sit down, what? <laughs> That's reality of what it's like to be in a relationship with a real person who's here and present and active within us. Don't lose heart over what I'm suffering for you. It's for your glory. And most of us think, Paul, they haven't even thought about it. He knew better. He knew they had. He knew they were astonished that this thing had come to them. And I want you to know that this is what it's like to meet Christ. You're so surprised that he would condescend to come and find you. And when he does, you're amazed at it. And you go, I wish this had happened to everyone I know. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. See, he's still on the same project of the mystery of the Gentiles. That according to the riches of his glory, He would grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Um, when, when, When preachers talk about their spirit man, which I think is weird language, this is what they're talking about. Because I don't I don't like to talk about my spirit man, I talk about me. It's it is it's me. I don't do the third person thing very well. (laughs) Be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, here's where I have to just make one little one one minute thing. Um, Becoming a Christian means Christ comes and makes his residence in you. So people invite Jesus to come in their life and that's, appropriate and the thing that he's celebrating that Christ has come and dwelt in their hearts. And and Christ, if you're not a believer, Christ wants to come and dwell within your life today. But the majority of the New Testament does not talk about Christ dwelling in you, but it talks about you being in him. This is that union with Christ thing. I'll I'll be audacious. No, I won't. There's not time. (laughs) All right. You see this? Verse 14 through 17. Hey, listen, that's one sentence. And you see that little dash? That was actually put in the text by the translators because he won't shut up. Because he does a run-on sentence. I can see his grammar teacher wrapping his knuckles for not learning how to condense his thoughts and his sentences. This is a run-on sentence. I love this about Paul. He just carries on like this. That you be rooted and grounded in love. And that's what I'm saying is why we do these things that we don't like to. And I hate those masks. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming. I don't know if I'd come if I were you. (laughs) You can expect me to be honest with you. (laughs) You can't get this stuff. (laughs) That you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength 
A minute ago, he was strengthening you and now you have it. That you may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. He's taking us to dimensions that we don't inhabit. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowing. Do you want to know how the love of Christ that surpasses knowing is known? You have to suspend your knowledge. You have to suspend your right to know. In other words, there's a kind of knowing that does not exist for the explaining. It exists for the encountering. Even as Paul talks about the peace that passes all understanding, the only way you can get the peace that passes all understanding is to, for, is to uh, remove your right to understand. Because the peace that passes understanding is the peace that comes when there's no explanation for what you're going through. And the love that surpasses knowledge is a love that is greater than, oh, you can't, you don't have, you don't have poem or prose or song to capture it. And you certainly don't have the mental capacities to quantify it. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And Paul here is taking us into a union with God that's unimaginable. And I have run out of time. I want you to prepare yourselves for communion. Because here's what happens. Just, just, just get the elements. Just, just get them and be ready. Because here's what happens. When, when Paul is saying something that he can't say, he breaks into doxology. And so before we receive Jesus in the elements today, I'm just going to say it. Now unto him who's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. All right, we come to the communion table and this is the moment at which we ingest the elements of the bread and drink the cup and this is the way we receive him into ourselves. Christ in us and the result of receiving him is that we are now in him. And so, in Jesus' name, I stand before you to speak blessing unto him who far more abundantly is able to do anything that we ask or think more than we can do according to his power that's at work within us. And Jesus took the bread and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is the body of Christ. Receive. Hallelujah. Jesus, he's so good. Thank you, Lord. This cup takes the whole human race. And though we are 
multi-skinned and multi-language and multi in every way. We are one blood. This is the blood of Christ. Lord, we thank you and we receive. Amen. Stand together, church. Hallelujah. We'll welcome your feedback about what you need and how this feels. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Now just receive. Just stand there and receive. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord, hallelujah, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace.